And then that's your piano. Well, welcome to Restoration. Uh, my name is Bryce Owens, and I appreciate everyone coming out and joining us this morning. So we have our sound, if you guys notice, it's all hooked up. So this is in the speaker. This is in Facebook Live. Uh, it took about four or five hours, and I have my brother come out. He hooked all the sound up for us and got it going. So Facebook Live. Uh, send a message. If you can hear us loud and clear, if we need to adjust anything, will you please let us know? And Deidre will do her best to adjust the sound. So all the sound is actually running. If you guys look over there, this is our sound area now. It's all running through our sound board. Uh, so Deidre can control that there. And then we have the piano up here. So that was a nice little, um, it took a little bit to get that up on the stage. So that was heavy. Uh, but we have it up here, make more room for more seating, which is good. And then if you notice, we have a drop cloth-esque thing over here. Did, 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 I don't know, if, did anybody notice that this morning? Did you? Were you curious about it? Okay, so our theme for 2021 is underneath of that cloth. And I have it hidden because I'm going to reveal that to us uh, towards the end, the end of the sermon. So that way you guys are, it's a cliffhanger. It's like, what did he write under there? I don't even know, all right? No, I do know. Uh, and uh, so I'm really excited about that. And hopefully it'll pull down the way I want it to. It doesn't pull all the ceiling tiles and basically half the ceiling down. So my family that's over there, if it just cover your heads, if it starts coming down, okay? So you never, I'm just warning you, you never know. Uh, so let's go ahead. Uh, before we pray for Pastor Tim, uh, we do that and we open that up. Uh, that's a little different on my iPad. Uh, just a few announcements. We have our Proverbs 31 day. That is this um, Saturday, and it's from 11 to 2. And we have a guest speaker coming from Bible Baptist Church of West Union. Um, so uh, she'll be coming here and giving a devotion. Then Deidre will do the second one. And there's games, there's food. So please come and, and fellowship with uh, ladies, it'll be a good time of just building each other up from other churches. We're going to invite other churches as well to this, which Deidre's already sent a message out to them. Uh, we just would like, would like to try getting a good count so we can plan for food. And then I will make stuff or Deidre will make stuff the night before to pass out, which is from me. Okay. Um, but uh, I don't think there's any other announcements that I can think of off the top of my head. Yes. Okay. Does everyone hear that? So there's going to be a teen devotional group that Deidre is going to be heading up. Um, so she has the devotional books for that. And I guess the teen girls will be getting together and having devotion time. So that'll be good. Uh, I knew about that. I just forgot about that. But I did know. Uh, anything else that I'm missing? 
No? All right. Well, let's go ahead and pray for Pastor Tim. Lift him up in prayer and uh, ask God for that continued healing. And we're also asking for his tablet, which, Mara, that should be coming soon, right? So we're hoping for it to be sooner, but uh, it's looking like the first, is it this upcoming week? I think it's when he's supposed to get it. I think Vicky said it was the first or second week in January. So let's go ahead and pray for that and uh, pray for that continued healing. Father, we love you, and we thank you for who you are. And Lord, we just ask that you be with Pastor Tim. We ask that you continue to heal his body and restore him. And Lord, you've already done a mighty work through him and in him. And uh, Lord, so many lives have been touched by even the situation that happened with him. But God, we know that uh, even though some a lot of good has come of this, that there's still heartache that has come from it as well. And there's been pain and there's been suffering and there's just been uh, tribulation for the Reigns family. And Lord, we just ask that... Uh, you just heal Pastor Tim and finish restoring his body and his mind. We ask that you bring the tablet uh, that he needs so he can uh, finally openly communicate with uh, Vicky and the doctors and Mara and uh, just be able to let his personality come out. And it's so exciting to uh, know that he's going to be getting that tablet. And he's already used it once, and uh, great things have, have come from that. But, Lord, we need that back. We need to let his personality finally come out so he can answer yes and no and just uh, be able to, to talk with his wife again, talk with his family again. And, Lord, we just ask that you be with Vicki. And, uh, Lord, I know that uh, she's having some toothache problems, and she needs a root canal. We ask that you just... Uh, be with her as uh, she is waiting on where to go to get that uh, taken care of, Lord. And uh, Lord, it just seems like there's one thing after another. But God, we know one promise is that you're never going to forsake them. You're never going to forsake us. You're never going to leave us. And Lord, we just ask that you be with them and comfort them. And uh, Lord, we just love them so much. And they're part of our church family. We've been praying diligently for them. And Lord, we just can't wait to see that that last final push and miracle of his restoration and uh, that he can come back and be able to serve you once again and be able to preach your word once again. And it's going to be amazing. And Lord, I just, I, I love the family so much. We love you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, man, that was weird. I didn't have my super early amen because he's not here. That's Matthew. He's the one that's like on it, like, amen, like right before. So it was weird not having him here. So we missed them. The Perkins family is not feeling well, so they're not with us. I'm not sure about uh, small group tomorrow night. I'll get a hold of uh, Jennifer and Greg and see how they're feeling and uh, gauge if we're going to have small group tomorrow night at their house or not. If not, then I'll figure something else out um, for somebody to possibly, you know, host it for tomorrow, <clears throat> Brittany and Eric. So, oh, I forgot I have a mic on. You guys can hear me. Uh, so let's go ahead and open your Bible up. <laughs> Father, <laughs> open your Bibles up to John. John chapter 21, John chapter 21, and we're going to start, I have the whole chapter that we're going to be going through today, but uh, this morning we're going to start in verse 15, John chapter 21, in verse 15, and I have this, the title of the, today's message is, Do You Love Me? And I have a question of this, too, underneath is, how much do you love Jesus? John, hi, Moots family. Come on in. John chapter 21 and verse 15, it says this. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, yea, Lord. Thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my sheep. He saith unto him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou? thou me. Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself 
and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Do you love me? Why would Jesus ask Peter this question? Let's pray. Father, we love you. And Lord, I just want to thank you for the reading of your word. God, I ask that you empty my mind out, my, my body, and just that I'm an empty vessel for you. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit now. Let your Holy Spirit be in this building. And Lord, we just ask that you just allow me to feed your sheep today. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's my early ameners. There it is. There it was. Thank you. <laughs> Do you love me? Why would Jesus ask Peter this question? You know, this is a hard question that takes place. Jesus is sitting here with his boys, and they're having a great time. And Jesus looks over at Peter and says, hey, Peter, and I'm sure Peter's like, yeah, Lord. And they're probably laughing, cutting it up, because this is the third time Jesus appeared to them since his resurrection, the third time. So I'd be really excited, and they're, they're dining and, and just having a good time around the campfire. They have fish and bread. And then I, I can imagine them just laughing, all right? And then Jesus is just looking over, and he goes, hey, Peter, yeah, Lord, do you love me? And it gets real heavy, real fast. Do you love me? Can you imagine what would be going through his mind in this moment, in this instance, that your Lord is asking you, not, not everyone else, just you, if you love him? Why? The why is what we need to understand. The why is that question that is, is what we need to figure out this morning together. To do this, though, to figure out the why, we need to go back to the beginning of this chapter. See, it's at the beginning it is, is where we will grasp an understanding of what is going on halfway down through this chapter. So we need to go back to the beginning of John chapter 21. We're going to be in the first three verses here. Go back to John at the very first beginning, the first verse. It says this. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. There were Simon, or there were together Simon Peter, and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. You see, when I look at these first three verses, do you know what I see? I see a defeated purpose. Who here has ever been defeated? Have you ever felt defeated before? Man, I can feel that way. I'll ask Deidre. I can feel defeated all the time. Robert said I was a woman outside, and so did Eric. And they're like, man, you are just like a woman, aren't you? And I said, you know what? I'm the emotional one in my relationship, and if I want to be like a woman, then I'm going to complain and be like a woman. Because you know what? I was at work, and I'm sitting there and break, and I told these guys this, and, uh, they, and Eric and Robert, they're like, you know what? Uh, we like our, the way our shape is. It's round, and it's okay. But I'm sitting there eating. And this, uh, I'm on break with my grocery manager, and then this dairy manager, she sits down with us, and she's eating, and we're having conversations, and she's asking if we're still working out and having healthy eating plans. I said, yeah, kind of. And then she looks right over at me, and she goes, Bryce, you're getting kind of rounded there. I was like, what do you mean rounded? She was getting kind of round. I was like, wow, really? I didn't even know how to respond. I'm like, Really? Rounded? I felt defeated at that moment. I'm like, <laughs> I do, and I just started eating it. I just started eating my, my my yogurt, and then I had my little my little snack thing, and then there was like some candy that some guy brought in, and I was like, no, I can't eat it, and I'm just I felt defeated. All right, I'll just be honest. I, I was defeated. I've been defeated in other areas of my life. That is something that is small and kind of minute. But when I look at the disciples, and you're probably sitting here thinking, man. How do you see a defeated purpose? They, they just got on a boat. They went fishing. How, how do you see that they were defeated? It's the very first phrase in verse 1. It says, 
after these things. You see, everything is in God's word for a purpose. What happened prior to chapter 21? Here's a few things that had happened. Peter denied Jesus how many times? Three times. Man, that would, that would have been hard. And he was grieved and he knew what he did. Jesus, their savior, their Lord, he was beaten and crucified. Then Jesus was resurrected after being buried for three days and three nights. He reveals himself uh, to them in a room. So they were up in this upper room, and it was after he resurrected, and he just revealed himself, and they had no idea what was going on. They went to this empty tomb running, and it's like, hey, his body's not there. We don't really know what's going on. Uh, Mary said that he's, he's resurrected, and she saw him, but we're just waiting, and I don't know what's going on. So there's this emotional roller coaster that is going on just like this in their life. And then all of a sudden, Thomas, uh, he doesn't get to see Jesus because Jesus entered into the room. And then Thomas wasn't there. I was like, where's Thomas? Well, then the disciples were like, hey, Thomas, we saw Jesus. We, we saw him. And he goes, yeah, I'm not going to believe that until I stick my hand in, or my finger in his nail-pierced hands and in his side. I'm not going to believe it. And then all of a sudden, here comes Jesus again. And he's like, all right. Here it is. Go ahead and stick it in there. And he's like, oh, Lord, it's you. And I'm sorry. I love you. And, and, and things like that. So that's what happened prior to this. Can you imagine that? This roller coaster ride, spiritually and emotionally, that they, they, they've been through. Can I tell you this? When On Sundays, when I am preparing to preach God's word, when I am getting ready, once I preach God's word, I am exhausted. I can't explain it. I, I really can't. It is exhausting to preach this. I would go home, and that's where the Baptist naps came from, which from exhaustion from preaching. Everyone's like, yeah, let's just have these Baptist naps. And everyone got exhausted from eating food. But it is, it is tiring. There's just something about it. I, I can't explain it. I can't imagine what Peter and all the disciples went through when all of a sudden they're with Jesus in the garden, they're praying, everything seems great, and everything seems good, and all of a sudden Jesus gets taken away. They see somebody that they love get beat and tortured, and hung on a cross to die. And then he's buried, and now they're just, what do we do? And then all of a sudden, he's not there. What do we do? And then all of a sudden, he appears to us, and he only does it twice, and he's not there. What do we do? And now you have Peter and some of the disciples, they're standing around, thinking, what do we do now? And everybody turns to Peter. See, Peter's the leader of them all. Peter's the one that is out there. Peter's the one that, that did a lot of things first, but but everyone's looking at Peter, and what is Peter's response? Peter felt so defeated that he went back to what he knew. He went back to fishing. That's why in, in verse 2 it says, they were together, all of them. And then verse 3 it says, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. A fishing. And they all looked at him and said, hey, we're going to go too. And so they got on a boat, and they went a fishing. Have you ever felt like your purpose was defeated? You know, some onlookers, I have a story that I found. Some onlookers thought it was unusual. But notice when the pastor wheeled into the church parking lot in a borrowed pickup truck, but everyone, everyone's eyes were upon him when he backed the truck across the lawn to his study door. Refusing comment or assistance, he began to empty his office onto the truck bed. He was impassive and systematic. First the desk drawers, then the files, and last his library of books, which he tossed carelessly into a heap, many of them flopping askew like slain birds. His task done, the pastor left the church, and as uh, was later learned, drove some miles to the city dump where he committed everything to the waiting garbage. It was his way of putting behind him the overwhelming sense of failure and loss that he had experienced in the ministry. This young gifted pastor was determined never to return to the ministry. Indeed, he never did. When we feel a sense of defeat, we often want to revert back to something that we, that we, that we know. And these disciples, they were in the ministry. They're in the ministry of Jesus Christ. They're going around, seeing miracles done, seeing all this stuff that was happening. And man, it was exciting. And then all of a sudden, Jesus is gone. He was taken away, and, and they've seen him come back. And then all of a sudden, he's gone, he's come back, and now they don't know what to do. So what do they want? They say, you know what? I guess we're done with the ministry stuff. We're done 
doing this. Let's just go fishing. That's what we know. That's what we're comfortable with. But church, can I tell you, there's going to be times in your life that you're going to feel defeated. There's going to be times that you just feel like you just can't go on. In Proverbs, there's a verse that I love, and it says, uh, when thou faintest in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Adversity is going to come your way. The devil's going to be coming, knocking on your door. And he's going to be saying, hey, you can't do this. And there are going to be times in your life that you're going to believe in that lie. There are going to be times in your life that you're going to be like, yeah, you know what? I just can't do this. Satan's going to throw the hordes of hell and the powers that he has at you, trying to get you to, to stop what you're doing, trying to get you to fall, trying to get you to stumble. But if you faint in the day of adversity, God says your strength is small. So stand. It's going to come at you, but don't give up. You're going to feel like you have that defeated purpose, but God doesn't want you to give up. Keep on going. Look at verse 3. It says, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, we also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught Nothing. I have that highlighted that they caught nothing because not only did we see a sense or a defeated purpose, and we saw them just feeling defeated. But look at this, this, this next thing we can see a restored excitement from the sun. You see, it says in verse three that they caught nothing. So all night they were going fishing. All night they had nothing. All right. Who here has gone fishing and caught nothing? I have gone fishing and caught nothing. All right. It is frustrating, is it not? When you, when you have nothing to show for it, it's like, man. Really, what I went on a couple of fishing trips and they were chartered. That's kind of easy. You just throw your pole out there. I mean, those things are just we, we caught a bunch of walleye, man. Those things just grab onto those fishing hooks and you can just pull them out, you know. But I end up having a carp, and some people are like, Yeah, that's disgusting. I'm like, I'll eat it. This fish is fish to me. I mean, I, I like that. People are like, That's disgusting. But man, when you're on a charter, you can just throw that out in the waters on Lake Erie and they just were gobbling those things up and we caught our max. But when you just go into like a regular pond, I don't know what it is. I've, I've gone fishing before in just a pond and I, just throw, wait, nothing. You just, I keep going back and forth. Man, it is so frustrating, especially when you have nothing. So these disciples, they're on this boat. They go out at night. They always go out at night. It's better to fish at night, by the way. Usually catch more fish at night than during the day because it's cool. And they catch nothing. But look what scripture says here. But, I love buts, Okay. Is that, I don't know if that's profound, if I, should, if I can say that. I love them. I, you know why I love them? Because when, when, when bad things seem to happen, and then all of a sudden there's a but, all right? I love it. I'm like, all right, this is a good but, all right? Not those, you guys are laughing. It's not that kind of but, all right? This is a good but, all right? And it says, but. <laughs> Got adults that are weird too. But when the morning was now come, when there's that daybreak, when there's light that can be seen because they were in darkness, but when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But, there's another one. Now, this is not a good but. The disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Look at verse 5. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? And they answered him, no. When I, when I read this verse right here, okay, I, I don't know how your mind works when you read scripture. Sometimes I, I play things out and I think, what really happened when they're on the boat? If I was on a boat and I went fishing all night, and all of a sudden the sun's coming up, and I see this guy because it said they didn't know it was Jesus on the shore. It's like, how do you not know him, guys? That was Jesus, all right? Because they weren't paying attention. They weren't looking. And they had this some guy just yelling, hey, you guys got any fish? and I caught nothing, I would have more of a, what do you think? No, I don't have nothing. We ain't got nothing. All right? I'd be frustrated. I'd be like, we, we, there's nothing. You know? And, and, and so they look, and it says, they answer him, no. And he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. So they cast, therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude 
of fishes. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, that was John, saith unto Peter, it's the Lord. Now, Simon, now when Simon Peter heard that, it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked. Now, he wasn't naked like you're thinking, but, you know, he probably didn't have a shirt on. He's probably just, you know, ripping it out and like, hey, guys, this is how we go fishing. So he grabbed his coat. He, he girded everything up so that way he wouldn't show anything, and he just grabbed it. And, and, and look what it says. And he did cast himself into the sea. Man, Peter was so excited when he heard it was Jesus. He didn't think twice. He jumped right out of that boat. He jumped into the water. He didn't want to wait for these guys bringing the boat all the way up. He didn't want to wait to drag the fish up that they caught. He's like, that's Jesus. I'm going straight to him. He got excited, man. Who here has ever gotten excited about something? Now, I should see every hand going up. Boom. I've gotten excited about stuff, all right? I Christmas. Who loves Christmas? I know we just had Christmas. It's that anticipation. All right. It's the anticipation. All right. That movie Elf, I have, Mara thinks I'm, I'm like Elf. All right. Like Will Ferrell in that movie. I mean, I do get excited about stuff like that. And I go, it's like, it's Santa. All right. You get excited. I know him. That's what Peter, it's, that's Jesus. It's like, I know him. And he's, whoa. And he just jumps straight out to the water. He doesn't care. And he goes right to him. And it says, and the other disciple, or the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as that were 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up, and drew the net to the land full of great fishes, 153. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish Likewise, this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. You know, when I saw this and that excitement was put back in, Peter got excited. But I can also imagine the others getting really excited because now they have this great catch. And they're sitting there dragging this net, all right, trying to row. And it's like, man, we got to get to Jesus. Peter's going to get there first. So they got excited. Uh, they caught a great haul. That would be exciting because they fished all night and they had nothing. So can you imagine you throw your net in on the side and it's like, yeah, all right. And all of a sudden your net, I mean, they had big nets. It just fills up. Did you see and catch how many fish they had? Did you guys catch that? How many was it? 153. But it wasn't just 100. I mean, you can have 153 minnows, right? It didn't say that. What did it say? It said they had a great fish. They were big. They were big old fish, 153, I mean, you know, a lot of times fishermen, I, they can almost be kind of liars, all right? Because I heard one guy talk about praising the Lord, and, you know, you have hand raisers, and they go like this. And it's like, okay, I caught a little fish, and then you're just praising the Lord. But if you're a liar, it goes about like this. Because usually f guys that go on the fishing trip, it's like, oh, man, it starts out, your fish was this big. And by the time, a year later, I mean, you had this big old trout or whatever, shark that you had caught, and it's just ginormous, all right? So they had these great fish. I mean, big, all right? I'm just big fish. 153 of them. That's a great haul. Can you imagine how much money they could have gotten from that? They were fishermen. That's how they made a living, right? They went fishing. They caught fish, took it in. They sold it to the fish market. That's how they made a living. They had a great haul and just one little catch. They didn't have to do much, and they were dragging it to shore. So I think it's fair to say that they were renewed in the spirit. But can I tell you this? It still wasn't enough. But this brings us to the climax of the message where we first read this morning. This brings us back to the great question that Jesus is asking, do you love me? You see, when we start, we can see, do you love Jesus more than your dot, dot, dot? You know what that means when I put dots there? It means you're just supposed to fill in the blank. I have my... Ladies on the front row, do you love Jesus more than your dot, dot, 
dot. What is it that you love Jesus more than? What is there? What is Jesus saying? Go to verse 15. Look at this. It says, so when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? You know what Jesus was saying right here? What did Peter just help bring up to shore? The fish, the great hall, an awesome hall. You know what he was saying? Hey, do you love me more than fishing? Do you love me more than this job that you know? Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than what you just brought in? And he says, he saith unto him, yea, Lord. It's easy for Peter to say, yes, I love you more than this. I love you more than what I just did. Because I was doing research on this. And there are two schools of thoughts when, when people were, were looking at this and Jesus says, do you love me more than these? And some people said, well, he could have been talking about the other disciples. But can I tell you this? Jesus, the son of God, would not cause controversy and pit the disciples against the disciples. Because if Jesus would have asked Peter that in front of all the disciples, that would have caused this whole issue and controversy. And the disciples, if you study the life of Christ, when they were going and doing his earthly ministry, they were always kind of fighting against one another. I mean, they fought against who would be on each side of Jesus. They argued of, of who would do what in heaven. And Jesus would not pit his disciples against one another. So it is not, are you, do you love me more than these disciples? It's, look what you just did and look what you brought in. There was a purpose in saying how many fish they caught. There was a purpose in the, in the, in the catch that they had because God wants us to see in his word that we can put things before him. He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my lambs. You know what? When we read that, did you catch how he said first, feed my lambs? And then he said, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. You see, lamb signifies the young ones, the children. I love our church family. And I even told somebody the, the majority of our makeup of our church is youth. It's young people. It's you guys. You know what? You guys, okay, I got some over here. You guys are the next generation. You guys are the ones that are going to be in this country and whatever's going to happen and whatever you guys are going to have to deal with when we're long gone, if we even make it that far before the rapture even happens, you guys are going to be carrying on the gospel. You guys are going to be carrying on God's word and it's going to be up to you guys to do something great. And so Jesus was saying, hey, the children are important. Guys, you are important. You know that there was a seven-year-old that ruled an entire nation because he did right in the sight of the Lord. King Josiah. Can you imagine? Who here is seven? I know Erica is almost seven. She's, what, six? Almost seven years old. Think about that. Think about your sister running an entire nation. Can you imagine that? How awesome would that be? You're shaking your head no. <laughs> that would be awesome. You guys can do amazing things if you allow the Lord to use you. Don't ever think that just because you're a child, don't ever think just because you're young that you can't do anything because there are going to be adults, there are going to be older people that are going to tell you, you can't do that. You can't do that till you get older. You got to get some more life experience first. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't do something for the Lord because guess what? You can. And Jesus cared about you first. Feed my lambs. You guys can do something. I'm looking, you can do something. Your mom told me to look at you if I was going to say something profound. Amen. Rain, you can do something for the Lord. And then this next part, he said, you know, do you love me more than your? I, I wrote this down again, dot, 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 because Peter went back to fishing. He did all this other stuff. But let me ask you this, church, do you love Jesus more than your job? What about your family? What about extracurricular activities? We have a lot of hunters and farmers and fishers and everything else that you guys are outdoorsy, okay? Do you love Jesus more than that? Are you willing to say, hey, you know what? Today is the Lord's day. Today is Sunday. I'm going to go and worship the Lord. 
I am going to go worship God. I don't take a day off from worshiping him. Uh, last year when we first started restoration, we came here and we, and we did our duties and I preached and stuff. And then we went to Florida and uh, I was on the midweek service, you know, and I still went and we found a church and we went to church that we not because I love worshiping God. I love going to and being around his people. There was another Sunday, even before we started restoration, we were gone on a Sunday. And when we went there, I think that time, there was one time that we, I preached to you guys and we still had a service and it was just us, which was fine. That's what we did when we first started our first service for restoration. But then there was another Sunday that we went to church and it was enjoyable. Me and Deidre went and we worshiped and it was great and we learned a lot. I don't take time off from worshiping God because it's important. You know what you're going to do when you go to heaven? Worship God <laughs> for an eternity. That's what you get to do. You're like, oh man, I had some lady said that was, she asked what you do when you get to heaven. I said, well, I said, there's streets of gold, so you can walk around on that. And there's man, yeah, but what are you going to do? You're going to drink? And it's like, no. I said, you get to worship the Lord. You're going to get to sit there and bow down and just say, holy, holy, holy. All right. Lord God Almighty. And they're like, well, that sounds boring. I said, you just wait. I said, you think, I mean, there's heaven. You're walking on streets of gold, people. You got a mansion, and then you get to worship God, and he is the light in heaven. It's always light and daytime. How amazing is that? But there are people that, that's boring. But that's what you're going to be doing. I enjoy coming here and worshiping. I enjoy worshiping my one true God. I enjoy fellowshipping with my other believers. Those extracurricular activities, hunting, fishing. I love it, guys, and, and I do. All right, I love going fishing. I haven't been hunting yet. Somebody's going to take me hunting. Hopefully I don't get shot, all right? Rain, Rain's going to take me hunting because she knows more than I do. And she's actually killed her. That was your first deer this year, right? She shot her first deer. That's awesome, all right? Praise God for that. That's awesome. I have not. But the first thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to be the first one to do it. I'm going to catch a deer, all right? You guys are cringing right now, I know. You're like, oh, you don't catch a deer, Bryce. I'm going to be the first one. But do you love Jesus more? <laughs> I better, I'm just going to hug it and let go, all right? Snap a real quick selfie. But do you love Jesus more than those extracurricular activities? What takes precedence in life? What are you saying? I don't have to worry about this. What about possessions? Possessions is a hard one. Possessions is something that can, can take hold of us and take root. We start thinking, I got to have a nicer house, a nicer car. And then we start living this American dream that we call it. We can have all this nice stuff and all this, this materials and things like that. And all of a sudden we make that an idol when you are focused on possessions more than you're focused on the things of the Lord, then you got an idol in your life. Think about that. Do you love Jesus more than your possessions? But then he asks this next question. So Peter passes the test. He's like, yes, Lord, you know, I love you more than all that stuff. Yeah, that was a great haul, but I love you more than that. So then Jesus is looking at Peter again, and he asked him the second time. Look at this in verse 16. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my sheep. That phrase, do you love me? You know, Jesus is now asking if he loves him and really how much. Peter said he loves him more than possessions, and now he said he loves him. This is more of a wide sense of, of, of how he's supposed to love. Everybody will say they love Jesus. Let me rephrase that. Every person that claims to be a Christian will say they love Jesus. This love is the phileo type of love, which is to have a brotherly love. We should have this with each other. It's a wide, expansive, hey, I love you. Have you ever just said, oh, I love you, man? Hey, I, I really love you. It's that, that brotherly love. You know, I love my church family, and I really do. I love you, Michael. I love you, Kitty. I love you, Tori. I love you, Annette. It's that brotherly love. We should have that camaraderie and that love for one another. It's a very broad sense, right? I would do anything. For, if you said, hey, Bryce, I need you to do something for me, I'd be there for you. I would, just because I have that brotherly love. Because I just want to serve and I just want to help. And we should have this with each other. But it's like Jesus is checking Peter's different levels. Do you love me more than this stuff? Okay, now do you love me like a brother? You know, I would do anything for my blood brothers, right? I have three of them. Now, the oldest one came and he set up our sound system. And you know what? 
Is this not awesome? Isn't it awesome? This is great. This is what he did at churches, and he did sound system and all this stuff, and it's amazing. All right? I'm like, check, check, check. It's great. I love it. You can hear me on Facebook, I think. Can they hear me on Facebook? A little choppy. Okay, it's a little choppy. We'll figure that out. All right? Deidre's trying to work on it. That's above her head, and it's way above my head, so I just fiddle with it a lot. All right? But there's nothing I wouldn't do for my brother. If my brother said, hey, Bryce, can you do something for me? I, yes, I would. Colby heard me talking about the sound at uh, Christmas. He says, well, I'll come out and I'll, I'll take care of it. He bought all this stuff, and I said, hey, I'll write a check for you. He goes, nope, this is my donation to the church. You can keep all the, the stuff. And I said, man, that's great. I said, thank you so much. You know how often I see my brothers? Twice, maybe three times a year. You know why? Because life happens. I've got a wife. I've got kids. We I have my church family. But it doesn't mean that we don't love each other. It doesn't mean that we hate each other. That's just the way it is. When I see him, it's like, hey, what's going on? I make fun of my youngest one for having a fake girlfriend. All right? She's not real. All right? I haven't seen a picture of her yet. It gets me a little frazzled, but that's all right. But you know what? I still love them. But, but what about, would you do anything for your brothers and sisters in Christ? You know, we should have a love for the people of your church family that even goes beyond a blood a blood relation. It goes beyond a love that is like, hey, you guys are my brothers and sisters. I'm going to do something for you. What do you need? I'll help you out. If I can do it, I'm going to do it. Hey, Bryce, what do you need? If I can do it, I want to do it. It's like, all right. You know, Eric did something small for me. Was it this this past week? I needed a little clamp for my, my vehicle to, to clamp it down. And you may not think it's much. And Eric, he got all these little parts. He got it from his, and, and helped out and I said, hey, I got six parts, right? Now, that might seem small to him. I'm like, hey, it's no big deal. And he even said it's no big deal. But can I tell you, it touched me. Somebody cared enough to say, hey, I have this part. I got what you need. And I can drive my vehicle now. And he did it. I didn't say, hey, Eric, can you look at your shit? He just did it. And he, he just loved me. That's a brotherly love. Hey, I just want to help. I just want to serve. Jesus is looking at Peter. Do you love me? Do you love me? And what is Peter's response? Yeah. Yeah, I love you. Of course I love you. You're my bro ham. We've done ministry work together. We went around together. Yes, I love you. That phileo is that brotherly love. I'm sorry, I should have moved that next slide because I had that written down. But look at this last one. Look at this last one. Verse 17. We can see the different levels of love. He, he wanted to see if he loved him more than, than his job, that possessions of fishing. He wanted to see if he loved him on that brotherly level. But can I tell you this? Jesus, oh, I love Jesus. He was not satisfied with that second one. Look what it says here in verse 17. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what, de by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Do you love me? This time it grieved Peter, if you notice that. This time, Jesus was asking, are you unconditionally affectionate towards me? That's a, those are some two pretty big words, is it not? Unconditional. Who here knows what unconditional is? Does anybody know what that is? Unconditional? I'm going to put it to you in, the, in a very simple way. Dogs have an unconditional love towards you, okay? I have a dog, Toby. He is annoying. I named him Toby because I watched The Office, and he's like Toby from The Office. He's just annoying, okay? Can't stand him. 
And he'll come in and it's like, Toby, you're annoying. But you know what he does? He still comes in because he wants that love. He has this unconditional love for me and the kids. Now, he might love the kids maybe more, but he still has that unconditional love towards Bryce. He loves me. He just comes. Who here has dogs? I know the casters have dogs. Those dogs have an unconditional love towards you, no matter what you do to them. All right? You can torture them. You can throw big bouncy balls at them to make them scurry away. You know what they do? They always come back because they love you, because you're their whole life. That's all they have until the day they die. I know that seems like weird. It's like, Bryce, you're talking about a dog, but you know what? Maybe we can learn something from that. Jesus should be our whole life. And we should have that unconditional, affectionate love towards him. Is there an action behind those words? The truth behind it is that Peter's actions right then, where he was at on that beach, did not represent that affectionate and intimate love for Jesus. Many Christians stop at verse 16, and they don't want to move on to the next one because this is where Jesus is saying it's time. This is where the rubber meets the road. See, Peter had such a zeal, and he had an excitement for Jesus. He was the first one to go all in. When it came to anything, Peter was a go big or go home kind of guy. He was the one that walked on the water. He wanted his whole body washed by Jesus. Uh, he was bold in saying that he wouldn't leave him. He uh, pulled his sword out to defend Jesus. He first acknowledged Jesus as the Son of God. Peter was on fire, and he had a passion. And there are times that that passion can be put out, like here in chapter 21. But it's when we look to Jesus and think about how much he loves us that our passion can be reignited. This word love here is agape. And if you've been in church long enough, I'm sure people, Bible studies, they've talked about this agape love. The first or that second one where he said, lovest thou me, that was that brotherly phileo love. But when Jesus went down to this next verse and he said, Peter, lovest thou me, this is do you agape love me? Do you have an unconditional, affectionate, intimate love towards me? A lot of us get, get scared about that word intimate. We're like, well, that's something a little different. That's about husband and wives. No, we don't want any of that. No, 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 no. Intimate means a closeness. Intimate means it's personal. Intimate means that you are just intertwined like this, and they are everything. I love my wife. And I strive having that intimate relationship, and it's that closeness with her, and that I love her. I want to get to know her. I want to know what she's thinking. I, I can just stare at her and be like, what are you thinking, hon? I'm like, what is she thinking when I'm looking at her? And then she's looking at me thinking, why is he looking at me? It's like, why does she have that scowl on her face? Did I do something? It's just because I'm looking at her. But we should strive to have that. But you know what? In church today, We've gotten away from that intimate relationship with Jesus. And now instead of having it like this, we're walking hand in hand and holding hands. These are likes to hold hands like this. All right. And there are times that I'm like, oh, my, my fingers are kind of chubby and, and there's just not a lot of room in between those things. And so I like to kind of hold hands like this. But she's like, I feel like I'm holding my mom's hand. I want to hold your hand like this. All right. I'm like, Ugh. okay. But that's what Jesus wants. But in Christianity today, in the modern church, this is what we do. All right, we'll just touch elbows. Actually, I can't touch my elbows, all right? It's weird. We just want to touch elbows. We just want to be like, hey, how you doing? We're just going to touch elbows, and that's it. Look at what happened since March. We've gotten to a point now where it's, hey, you got to social distance. Keep six feet apart. All right, we'll, we'll, six, feet, six feet away, all right? We don't want to look at you. Put that mask on so we can't see your face. Just six feet away. You know, I don't want to see your smile. You just keep that distance. Look what the world's trying to get us to do. Jesus, he wants this. No, I want, you're not going to stay six feet apart from me. I want all of you. I want to see you face to face. I want to see that smile. I want to see that joy. That's what Jesus wants. Church, don't let the world stop you from having an intimate relationship with Jesus. Because when you have that intimate relationship with Jesus, you can have an intimate relation with your brothers and sisters in Christ. It can be more than just that brotherly love. It can be more. It can be tight knit. It can be like this where you're going hand in hand because in a world that is just wicked as hell, we need to be joined and tightly knit together. 
Robert has a, he made it for Tirza and, and uh, Colt. And it was rope, correct, that you had that's intertwined. And it's from that verse uh, where it says, uh, if two are together, then when one falls, you can pick the other up. But if three stand together, they're not so easily broken. There's power in numbers. Church, when you come together to assemble with God's people, there's power when we gather together. We need to stick together so we're not so easily broken. To have that unconditional, intimate love. And I know that there are times your passion can waver. There can be like a wet blanket that just puts it out. You're like, I'm just not feeling it like I was a year ago. I'm just not feeling the restoration thing. It's always exciting when you have a new church plant. It really is. When there's a new church plant, people are like, oh, new church plant? Yeehaw! Let's get on board with that. Woo! They, they, they really do. We've had some people come in here and like, hey, we wanna, we're going to do this. And then all of a sudden, it's like, okay, see you later. We're done. That newness kind of wore out. <laughs> Jesus wants you in it for the long haul. He wants you to have that intimate time. Where is your passion? Where is your passion? This is the theme for this year. I love Jesus enough to dot, dot, dot. <sighs> Jump. <sighs> It didn't fall down. That's good. In the year 2021, we're in this. I want to ask you this question. I want you to ask yourselves this. I love Jesus. It's not really a question. It's a statement. I love Jesus enough to what? We have markers and our pens and stuff up here. And what I want my church family to do is whatever God is laying on your heart for the year 2021, whatever God is laying on your heart this year, I want you to write it up on that wall. It's going to be seen by your church family. Your church family is going to hold you accountable. Your brothers and sisters are going to love you so much that we're not going to have this just a separation. It's going to be an intimate church family. You write it up there. Hey, Michael, what you going to put up there? I'm going to hold you accountable to it. Kitty, I'm going to hold you accountable. Tori and Annette, whatever you put up there, I'm holding you accountable. I'm going to be on you like a fat kid on cake. And Annette knows cakes, and I know her cakes, and they're delicious, by the way. But that's what our theme is going to be. I love Jesus enough to. I want to close with this last verse. I want to close with this last verse. You know, I find it so interesting. When I'm reading down and you have verse 15 where Jesus starts asking Peter how much he loves him. And then he says this in verse 17. And in verse 18, it says, He saith unto him the third time, Simon, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he had said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, then feed my sheep. You know, this is the third time Jesus had to say this to him. And prior to this, how many times did, did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. There was three times that Peter did not show that he loved Jesus. There was three times that he denied him. He denied the name of Christ to everybody that was asking him. Church, I am asking you today, do not deny your Jesus. Do not sit here and just an apathetic state. Don't be a Peter in the beginning. Be a Peter in the end. See, Peter lost that passion. He said, I, I don't know that man. I don't know him. I don't know him. And Jesus looked at him and said, all right, well, this is what I'm going to do with Peter. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And it grieved him because he knew. Have you ever just known? You sit there and you're just thinking about Jesus. You're thinking about God and you're just sitting there. I just know. I'm wicked and I've messed up. Have you ever just done that? I have. I've sat there and just pondered my life and what I've been doing for him. I was in there, I don't love him enough because it comes down to a love. I've stopped at a brotherly love. Yeah, I love Jesus. 
I do, I love him. But do you love him? I love Jesus enough to what? Hey, young people, I love Jesus enough to what? Be a missionary? To live a godly life? To not let generational curses stop me like it stopped my parents, maybe? Think about that. We all come from different backgrounds, different, and how we were raised, there's generational curses that affect families. Children, you do not have to let the sins of the parents affect you. You can rise above it by living for Jesus. Don't stop. Do you love him? I love him enough to be a missionary. I love him enough to be a pastor and, and preach his word. I love him enough to get involved in my Restoration Church family to serve him in some capacity. I love him enough, enough to go to work, and I'm going to give the gospel to my friend. I feel ashamed even right now. My grocery manager sat there and told me. I thought he was saved and said, in year 2020, you know what I want to do, Bryce? And I'm sitting there doing something in the freezer, and he goes, I want to get saved. And I'm like, what? I want to get saved. I, said, I, I was like, I, I couldn't get the words out. I was excited and at the same time shocked and surprised. And, and then all of a sudden people, would, like it was like the devil heard that. And the devil was coming in and then people would, was distracting him. And I was trying to give him the gospel. I'm like, dude, this is how you can get saved. You just got to accept Jesus into your heart. And it didn't happen. And, and then yesterday I tried doing it again and the devil was stopping it. It's so frustrating. And I'm standing here on a Sunday preaching to you saying, do you love Jesus enough to go out there and witness to somebody when I have a friend that I love that right now, unless he gets saved at church, said he's going to talk to his pastor, is going to hell. Because I didn't say, throw the distractions out and say, this is what you need to do, Tyler, to get saved. I love him. I would crawl on glass. I would have my legs broken if he would just accept Jesus. If that's what it took to get to him, I will do it. Do you, but do you love Jesus enough to do that? Do you love him? Peter was grieved. And Jesus looked at Peter and he said, listen, you're still young, but you were a young man. You were all in. I'm not talking about being halfway in. I'm not talking about just dipping your foot. Church, be like Peter. We need to be in it all the way. You need to love him all the way. Because you know what? Jesus loved him all the way. Jesus went the distance for Peter. Jesus went to the cross. Jesus went there and hung and was beaten, spit on and ridiculed, and even took the denial of somebody that he loved and said, he denied me three times. I am so ashamed that I'm not what Jesus wants me to be. Your own pastor. And I remember sitting here when God spoke to me about, this is what I want you to live out, Bryce, in your church family for the year 2021. Get that passion reignited. Jesus looked at Peter, and he said it right here in this verse. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. You know what? Peter was going to get so old. He was going to get so decrepit that he can't go out and give the gospel and, and do what he'd want to do. So you know what happens? Somebody's going to carry him on their, he's going to get on somebody's back, piggyback ride. And he was still going to go around and do what Jesus wanted him to do. And then he looks at him and says, this spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he has spoken this, he looks right at Peter and he saith unto him, follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Jesus is looking at each and every one of us right now. He is reaching out with that narrow pierced hand. And he's looking down. Young people, he's saying, follow me. What's holding you back? Follow me. Teenagers, he's looking at you. He wants you. He's looking at you with those nail pierced hands. He's saying, follow me. What's holding you back? Parents, I'm looking at a church full of mom and dads. Jesus is looking at you. And he's calling out. And he's saying, do you love me? And we're sitting here in our chairs and we're thinking, yeah. But he's looking and he goes, no. 
You've got a zeal and a zest for life. I know it. You can have that passion again. And he's looking at you with the nail-pierced hands saying, follow me. What is holding you back from following him? He wants your heart. He wants all of you. But are you willing to give it to him? We're going to get ready to go into my or our song service. We're going to get ready to worship the Lord. Does Allegra have the mic? Allegra, do you have your mic? Okay. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. We're going into this year. And then the theme for the entire year is I love Jesus enough to. This is a love that's going to build over time. This is a love that is going to transform each and every one of us. But maybe you're sitting here today and you don't know Jesus. Maybe you're sitting here today and nobody's ever presented the gospel of Jesus Christ to you. Can I present it to you today? You see, Jesus came here in the form of a baby. We just celebrated Christmas. But the story doesn't end there. He grew up and he started his earthly ministry. And Jesus is the son of God. He lived a sinless, perfect life. And in the end, he was beaten. He was spit upon. And he was hung on a cross. And when he was hanging on that cross, he was thinking about every single one of us in this building today, the entire world, the weight and the sin of the entire world, past, present, and future, was on Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. You see, it's a choice to follow Jesus. It's a choice to ask Jesus into your heart and to save you from your sin. You think you're bad and you think you're wicked? Your pastor that's standing up here preaching is a bad, wicked man in the heart. But you know what? It was covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And I accepted him at a young age. And it's been a tough life ever since. I've sinned more after salvation than I did before. I know more about sin than I did when I was a kid. But none of that matters. What matters is you accept the free gift. You don't have to go to a place called hell because Jesus died so you wouldn't have to go there. But you and you alone have to accept it. If you have done that, praise God. If you're like, well, I don't know how to do that. It's easy. You just believe it in your heart. You accept it. Pray and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray. And when we get done praying, we're going to stand and we're going to be singing praises to our God. We're going to be singing about loving my Jesus. And if you want to know more about salvation, if you want to know more about Jesus, I'm going to challenge you with something. I want you to come forward in this front row if you don't know Jesus as your Savior. And I'm going to show you Jesus in the Bible. I'm going to show you how you can get saved so you don't have to go and burn in a place called hell. And the worst place about hell is not the fire, it's not the torment. It's not about the screaming and gnashing of teeth. The worst part about hell is that you will never, ever be near to God again. And I don't want you to have to go through that. Father, we love you. And Lord, if there's somebody here today that has not given their life to Jesus, I pray that they will be bold and come forward to ask Jesus into their heart to know more about Jesus, the Savior that loves us. God, I thank you for my salvation. Lord, I pray that Tyler accepts Jesus today. And Lord, I'm ashamed I didn't give it to him in the last two days. Lord, I'm sorry that I didn't overcome the devil. I'm sorry I didn't do what I was supposed to do. I love you, Jesus. And I love you enough to today to go to him. I will drive to Goshen. I will drive to his house. And I will show him Jesus today. I promise, Lord, after this service, I will call him. I will do it, Lord, because you have called me to do that. And if there's somebody here that doesn't know Jesus, I pray that they will come up here and ask me. And I will show them too. Lord, I love you. 
and I love you enough to do what you want me to do in my life. And if there's other decisions that are going to be made today, I pray that they will put them up on that wall and solidify it. And they will live that out this year. And they will keep adding to that wall all year long, Lord, and transform and have a love that is growing for you. We love you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand.